Guys, let's go ahead and get started here. Great to be together. Thank you for coming to be with us here this afternoon. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying that and enjoying some time together with some people you love. Um, I want to, uh, why don't we start with a prayer actually, before we go any further. Let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we are just grateful to come before you, grateful for you giving us your son. Thank you for redeeming us, God. Thank you for giving us new life. Thank you for just your heart, that your heart is not as a taskmaster or slave master, but God, that you truly want us to thrive. You, you want us to be who you made us to be, God, that you, you just have this beautiful vision of us as redeemed creatures, just living life to the full. Father, I pray that you'd help us to really experience that reality, not just in the life to come, but, but now, God, that we'd be able to really thrive in this life now, even amidst the trials and the the fears and the anxieties, God, help us to experience life to the full with you. God, we know it's only possible through Jesus. We just pray you help us to connect with you and with, and with him more through this series, God, that you would just uh, help us to relate to you in a healthy way. God, help us to uh, identify ways that we may have not been relating to you in the best way. God, help us to uh, just learn more and more and experience more and more who you are as our father, as our friend. Uh, as our just leader, as, as all the hats that you wear, God. Help us to know you better through this, this series. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. So I'm excited to start this brand new sermon series for the summer. It's going to be based on this book. Uh, if you saw the message, by, it's by Sky Jathani. It's called With. With. If you didn't get a copy, I think there's four more in the table in the back there. There's 10 bucks if you want to get a copy. Um, I would encourage you guys to read along with us, although it's certainly not, you know, I'm not going to be going house to house enforcing this. So, you know, if you don't want to do that, it's fine. But if you'd like to read along, please do pick up a copy. Um, I found the audiobook was great for, to listen to as well. So if you're more into that, by all means, do it. But um, the subtitle in the book is, it's with, and it's reimagining, I don't know if you, you can't really see, it's hard to see up there, but it's reimagining the way you relate to God. So, the whole purpose here is that we would relate to God in the proper way. And I think that's super important. If we're going to thrive in our faith, for our faith to be a joy and not just this burden, we need to relate to God properly in the way that he intended. Jesus says that my yoke is easy, my burden is light. But in order to experience that, sometimes, I think sometimes, if we're honest, our, our faith can feel like a heavy yoke. that doesn't feel light all the time. And I think a lot of times that can be because of how we're relating to God. And so... The point of this series is, is it's not just back to basics, okay? This is going to be challenging for those of us who have been around for years. It's going to be helpful for those of us who are brand new to the faith. This is going to help everybody at every stage, I believe. Great read for anyone in any season of their spiritual journey. So what I want to do today is I just got two kind of points, two sections here we're going to talk about, and they're based on the first chapter in the book, okay? So um, I'll give you a little kind of taste here, and then when you read it, you'll, you'll see more for yourself. But I want to talk about life after Eden. And then I want to introduce you to kind of the basic premise of the whole book here, which is the four, what we call the four postures, four ways of relating to God. So this first one is life after Eden. Uh, it's a little bit dark and a little bit hard to see there, but in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, I remember going there uh, several years ago and walking around looking at the, at, the, at the art, and I remember being struck by this painting. This painting's hanging in the Museum of Fine Arts in, in Boston. Uh, the painting is called Expulsion from the Garden of Eden. It's by Thomas Cole, painted around 1828. And if, if you look, you can kind of see, I know it's, I know it's a little dark, but on the right is, is Eden. It's this light, lush, beautiful place. And then there's kind of this gateway, this light coming out. And right there are these two tiny little people, and they're being expelled from the garden. That's Adam and Eve, you know, and then there's this dark, that's, that's a volcano in the background. It's just this dark, ominous world. And, it's, it's, you know, this portrayal of the story that we see in the Bible of, of, of Adam and Eve, of man losing that closeness with God and Eden being cast out. And uh, we see this here. Actually, we'll get to Genesis in a second. But in John chapter 1, in John chapter 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And of course, later on, in verse 14, same chapter there, it says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And so we understand that Jesus, right? Jesus is the capital W Word. 
And that Jesus, according to verse 1 from the very beginning, was with God and was God. And so this is where we get the idea of the Trinity. The Trinity, this idea of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that they are these uh, unique and yet unified uh, being. It's, it's, it's God is three persons in one being. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around because you are one person in one being. Right? But God is three persons in one being. And this idea comes from passages like John 1, where it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. And what's significant, but there's a lot of things significant about the Trinity. Um, but what it tells us is that before anything was made, right, before a single atom, before a single, you know, molecule, before any human ever existed, God existed in the form of relationship. God is this eternal, coexisting, just relationship, this loving community. God himself is a community of these three, these three persons in his one being. Does that make sense? It's kind of hard, again, a little bit weird for us to wrap our minds around. There's no real parallel in our world. But before anything ever existed, God existed in the form of relationship, in this loving community, Father with Son with Holy Spirit. And the reason God made us, people want, some people may ask you this as a Christian, they may say, why did God make man? The reason God made us was to include us in that community of love. God didn't make humans because he was lonely. He didn't make humans because he needed servants just to do stuff for him. God made us in order to include us in this eternal community of love that already existed in and of himself. It's kind of like why parents choose to have children, to include the child in this community of love that already exists between husband and wife. It's not to produce servants, although it's nice if they eventually learn to serve. It's not because the parents are lonely. Some spouses who feel lonely, they might choose to have kids as a way to kind of keep the marriage together. That never goes well. Ideally, in a, in a healthy family, you're not, make, you're not having kids just to produce servants or because you're lonely. Healthy families have children simply out of a desire to share the love that already exists, out of this overflow of love that's already there between the husband and wife. So it is with God. God made us, in short, to be with him. Not to do anything for him. Well, it's great if you do that. But to be with him. And so, in Genesis, if we go back to Genesis, in Genesis 1... Let's review this story. I know many of, us, many of us know this, but this really sets the basis for everything that we're going to talk about here. In Genesis 1, verse 26, God's making the world, and it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. It's an interesting word. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule, there's that word again, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God's intent from the very beginning and his intent for us even at the end of things, we'll see this even in Revelation, that God's intent is for us to partner with him in ruling over his world. Jathani says it pretty well in his book, so I just put the quote up here. He says, Eden, the Garden of Eden, is best understood as kind of this base camp. This base camp from which the man and the woman were to extend God's garden to encompass the entire earth. They were intended to partner with God as his representatives and agents on earth. The man and woman were instructed to, quote, rule over the earth on God's behalf and cultivate the order beauty and abundance of Eden in every corner of creation. That was the intent. To kind of spread God's rule, God's reign, God's beauty across the whole world to kind of rule on his behalf, to kind of be the co-workers in the harvest field, as Jesus would say in John 4. And even at the end of the story, if you go all the way to Revelation, from, from kind of cover to cover of the Bible, this is where things are ultimately headed. In uh, Revelation 21, John has this vision. He says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Later on in chapter 22, it says, they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord their God will give them light and they will reign. There's that ruling idea. They will reign forever and ever. So this has always been God's intent to partner with him in ruling his world. And of course, that's a beautiful picture, but we know the story, right? What happened to mess that up? Sin, right? Sin entered the picture. If we go back to Genesis in chapter 3, again, I, I know we know this, but hang with me here. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave it to some to her husband, who was standing there like a chump doing nothing, and he ate it. It's not what it says, but that's what he was doing. Now, you read the story, and you can blame the serpent, right? You could say, oh, it's all Satan's fault, but ultimately the man and woman made a choice. And the choice wasn't just to eat some tasty-looking pomegranates, okay? The choice was really, I think, rooted in that highlighted phrase there, this, this desire to be like God. Instead of ruling with God, they wanted to rule on their own terms. And fundamental to all of this is fear. At a fundamental level, what the serpent introduced was this idea, you can't trust God. There was this fear that's, that, that the serpent planted, that, hey, God's holding back on you. God doesn't have your best intentions at heart. If he did, why would he restrict you? You need to take things into your own hands. And he plants this, this fear that God can't be trusted. And in response to the fear, what do you need to do? You need to take control. In response to fear, you need to find, you need to take control. All sin is basically rooted in that very premise. All sin, name the sin, it, it's all rooted in this idea. I can't trust God to meet my needs. I must take things into my own hands. In response to fear, we grasp for control. We were made to rule with God, but because of sin, we live in this world that's ruled by fear and control. This is what we call, quote, life after Eden. This is the world in which we live, life after Eden. So we have to realize that you and I, even now, thousands of years later, we're not immune to this. As Christians, we easily fall into the same trap of fear and control. And that's where we get to this, the second half here, which is the four postures. Okay? And this is the, the, the four ways of relating to God that are put forth in this book that we're going to kind of go through here together in the next several weeks. Four postures, four ways to relate to God that are ultimately unhealthy. They're, they're means of trying to deal with fear, trying to grasp for control. And a lot of them really look like genuine Christianity. And that's the thing about it, is these are subtle. But they're so important that, that we learn to identify and then relate to God the right way. So four ways to relate to God. None of these are, are the ideal, because what we're looking for is life with God. We want life with God the whole premise of the book. But you have instead, there's life over God, life under God, life from God, and life for God. Now, just hearing those, before I even explain anything, did any of those strike you as like probably not good? What's that? Over, right? Yeah, over seems like probably the most obvious. You go, doesn't seem good. We probably shouldn't be putting ourselves over God. Which of these seem like they would be a good thing? What's that? Life for God. I'm going to live my life for God. Absolutely. 
Maybe even life under God. You go, yeah, I'm submitting my life under God. And that, again, that's the thing, is a lot of these look pretty good outwardly, but we're going to get into the heart about why, at the end of the day, they don't actually help with our fear and control. Each of these postures does have some truth to it, but all of them are means of dealing with our fear and seeking control. So I'm going to briefly introduce these, and then we're going to spend the next several weeks getting a lot deeper into them as we go through the book. So the first one here is life over God. Life over God. Life over God is what it sounds like. It's a posture of being above God. God, you know, we don't want God over us. We want to be over God. And so who would this be? This could easily be uh, the atheist, the agnostic, someone who just doesn't want God in their life at all. But this could also be the Christian who is more interested in God's principles than in God himself. Okay? Okay. It's more into being more interested in God's principles. God's kind of seeing the Bible as just kind of a manual for success in life. And not so much relationship. That's what this picture is. This is from the book. You know, the, the marionette puppets, right? That's, that's what's being illustrated there. And if you're trying to gain control, like that's the marionette, you can think of the strings as God's laws, God's principles, through which we can control the world, control things around us, okay? God is off to the side. He doesn't really have anything to do with it. And that's the whole problem with this, this posture. It reduces faith to principles and laws. Think of phrases like this. Five steps to a more godly marriage. How to raise kids God's way. Biblical laws of leadership. Managing your finances with kingdom principles. Right? These are things that aren't necessarily... Maybe you've heard phrases like that. You maybe you've took courses or read books on things like that. These aren't bad. But the problem is you can apply these principles without actually having any kind of relationship with God. Does that make sense? You can use God's kind of instructions without actually even knowing God. Maybe you've heard the idea that the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, have you heard this one? That stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. You ever heard that? Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. It's a humorous way of thinking of the Bible, but is that what the Bible is? Is it just instructions? Is it just good morals and teachings and principles to live by? The problem is if the Bible is the repair manual with all the tools you need, why bother with the mechanic? That's the problem. You got all the tools you need, why bother with the mechanic? Life over God wants God's methods for success, but not necessarily God himself. And this is very subtle because it's really easy to fall into this without realizing it. Life under God is number, t- is number two here. Life under God is the natural reaction to life over God. So we go, okay, well, I don't want to just be over God, so let me submit myself to be under God. Life under God, though, is just another way of seeking control. And it seeks control by controlling God. How do you control God? Well, through your obedience, through your sacrifice, through your good morals. Through our obedience and through our worship, we put God into our debt so that he does what we want. Here's the picture. Here God is involved. You have the marionette, but what we're trying to do is through our good behavior, through our obedience, we get to control God who controls the world. It's just another way of seeking control. And again, this one looks very devout. This one looks very spiritual on the outside. But it leads to a, life, a, life, a lifestyle that has some, some problems. So in the book, he shares this example. He says, consider the example of Steve Johnson, wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills. Okay, on November 28th, 2010, the Bills faced off against their rival Pittsburgh Steelers. I know we have some Steelers fans in the house. I'm sorry about that. Um, where's Wes at? Anyway, the Bills faced off against the rivals of Pittsburgh Steelers. The Bills ultimately lost the game when Johnson dropped a pass in the end zone during overtime. After the game, via Twitter, he publicly blamed God. So they, they lose. He dropped the key pass in, during overtime. And he tweets. He does this tweet. Okay? And here's what he says. He says, man, I praise you 24-7. And this is how you do me. You expect me to learn from this? How? I'll never forget this. Ever. That's life under God. That's the, and that's the example of the problem with this posture, Right? They go, I praise God. I do my part. So what happens when God doesn't do his part? Your faith crumbles, right? You get 
go into a faith crisis. Or how many parents have read Proverbs 22, verse 6, start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. How many parents have read that, leaned on that, only to be, have a crisis with God when their child rebels later? I did my part. Why didn't God do his? And, you know, I've, I've, I've fallen into this personally where, you know, when I was in campus ministry, I was taught that for fasting, you always fast for something. You, you fast to kind of make God do something. That's actually not what fasting is about. You don't fast to get God to do something. You fast to get God. And through that, things happen. Through that, things change. But, you know, we'd always fast for people to come to become Christians or for visitors to come to our retreats. And again, it's not bad to, to ask God for things during your fast, but it's, a, it's just another way of trying to, I'll, I'll do this so that God has to do that. And that's ultimately not what it's really about. This was a dominant view even in Jesus' day. Remember in John 9, Jesus encounters the blind man? And there's this blind man, and do you remember what the disciples say? They say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There's this assumption. Someone sinned, right? If, if you obey, you're blessed. If you don't obey, you're cursed. So someone must have sinned because this guy's blind. And do you remember how Jesus responds? He says, neither. Neither. This happened that God might be glorified. Jesus pushed back strongly against life under God. It's, it's really probably the dominant view of the Pharisees was life under God. We'll unpack this a lot more in the coming weeks. Life under God looks good outwardly, but at the end of the day, it's another means of gaining control. Number three is life from God. Life from God. You guys doing okay? Yeah. This, this stuff just like, it, I bore into me when I, when I was reading this book because I felt like I've, I've been every one of these at different points. And maybe you're starting to see some of that yourself. Life from God is not so much about seeking control for our fears. It's a little bit more about kind of padding our fears with God's gifts and with God's comfort. Just as life over God doesn't want God, life over God wants God's principles. Life under God doesn't really want God. It just wants what God can do. Similarly, life from God doesn't want God so much as what God can give. Classic example of life from God would be the prodigal son, right? Father, give me my share of the inheritance. I don't care about you. You're dead to me, but give me your wealth, right? That, that is life from God. In its most extreme form, this would be the prosperity gospel. You've probably heard of, you know, these televangelists who will promise, you know, this life of prosperity if you just have the faith to claim it, right? There's this prosperity gospel out there that's just ridiculous but in its more subtle form life from god might look like seeing god as our divine therapist a means of taking away our anxiety or someone who can fix our marriage issues or take away an addiction and certainly god can do those things but do we actually want god himself or do we just want what god can give us do for us Another way we see this is with consumer Christianity. You show up to church and you consume a product, right? You, you, you show up to church to see a good presentation and be entertained and to feel something. So many people are just seeking an emotional experience at church. They want to come and feel something. Church becomes about me and what I can get out of it. Church should be to comfort me. It should be entertaining and engaging for me to distract me from my hectic life for an hour or two. This is the person who says things like, I didn't really like worship today. And I, w I love Francis Chan's response to that. He goes, I didn't know we were worshiping you. <laughs> I didn't know we were worshiping oh, That's interesting. You didn't like it. I'm sorry. But in this posture, God is a source of comfort or entertainment or a doctor or a therapist to fix our problems. And we try to seek peace and alleviate our fear through what God can give us when peace is actually found in being with God himself regardless of what he does or does not give. Lastly is life for God. Life for God is the natural reaction to life from God. We go, well, I don't want to, I don't want to be a prosperity gospel Christian. I don't want to be a consumer Christian. I'm going to live my life for God. This is the person who perhaps gives up their wealth or their career to serve God. This is a posture highly celebrated. In many evangelical circles, this is, a, this is a posture that even in our own history as a movement, 
we have highly celebrated this where we go, yeah, the person who doesn't finish their PhD and goes into the full-time ministry, we go, wow, amen, what a sacrifice, how admirable. And there is something admirable about that. But the problem with life for God is that it just trades one idol for another. It trades the idol of God's gifts for the idol of God's mission. And the mission is good, but it can become an idol. It's this idea of seeking to have impact for God. And it looks noble, it looks sacrificial, but deep down we are grasping for a sense of worth and significance. Our sense of self-worth is measured by what we can accomplish for God. There's a uh, really good, I think, testimony from the guy who uh, created VeggieTales. And it's in the book. I'm just going to read this little section to you. It's in page 90. If you already have it, you can read along with me if you want. On uh, page 90, I, th- I think I actually might have put it up here. Yeah, we'll get to that. So it says, Phil Vischer, the creator of VeggieTales. Okay, who's seen VeggieTales? Cody's seen all, every single episode probably twice. Amen. VeggieTales. Let's go. Biblical vegetables. A success, uh, the creator of VeggieTales, this guy Phil, a successful series of Christian home videos and films featuring computer-generated fruits and vegetables, was raised in a life-for-God environment. His experience reveals how the fear of being insignificant is implanted into young people. He said the heroes of his community celebrated, the heroes his community celebrated were the, quote, Rockefellers of the Christian world, those who were enterprising, effective, who made a huge impact for God. They launched massive ministries or transformed whole nations. This led Vischer to conclude that impact was everything. Quote, God would never call us from greater impact to lesser impact, he wrote. How many kids did you invite to Sunday? How many souls have you won? How big is your church? How many people will be in heaven because of your efforts? Impact, man. But after losing his company in 2003... Vischer began to question the validity of the life for God values he had inherited and that had driven his earthly career. This is his own writing. He says, The more I dove into scripture, the more I realized I had been deluded. I had grown up drinking a dangerous cocktail, a mix of the gospel, the Protestant work ethic, the American dream. The savior I was following seemed, in hindsight, equal parts of Jesus, Ben Franklin, and Henry Ford. My eternal value was rooted in what I could accomplish. My eternal value was rooted in what I could accomplish. That's the problem with life for God. If the younger son in Luke 15 represents life from God, right? If the prodigal son is life from God, hey, I just want your stuff, then the older son in the story is life for God. You remember the older son, the the, the younger son comes home, the father throws his banquet, and the older son's out there in the field and he won't come in. And so the father goes out to him to try to, to try to talk to him. And I don't know if I had this up on the screen. I don't think I did. But in Luke 15, 29, he says, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Right? But when the son of yours comes home, you know, with squanders your wealth and prostitutes comes home, you kill the fat cow, right? But the older son, I think, was in this life for God posture. He was seeking significance and recognition through his own, through his sacrificial life. But the problem is we can't just trade one idol for another. God's work is important. God's mission is important. But it's not more important than God himself. And so the point here, guys, is that life over, under, from, and for God are all means of dealing with our fear by seeking control, either to control God, to get God to give us something, to get God to do what we want, or to get significance from God by by trying to show that our life is meaningful. All of them fall short in truly delivering us from our fear. Only life with God can truly free us from fear. Only life with God, only with God can we let go of our need for control. And I'll end with this thought here, is that the beautiful thing is we don't have to figure this all out ourselves. Just as we looked at in the very first scripture today, it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus is Emmanuel, which means what? 
God with us. God took it upon himself to repair what was broken in Eden. Jesus came and laid down his life to forgive our sin, to bridge this gap that we might be with him once more. Let's pray. Father God, we're just grateful that you took it upon yourself to initiate, to go first, God, to repair just this brokenness between us. Thank you for sending your son, God. Thank you for being willing to give up everything just to be with us. God, I don't know if I, if I look at my life that I would give up as much as you did just to be with me. God, I'm just grateful that you've, you apparently felt like it was worth it. God, I'm so grateful for your heart, grateful for your son, Jesus. And I do just want to ask that you would help us to identify how we've been living either over, under, from, for you, God, and that you'd help us just to really embrace a life of, of being with you, God. You'd help us to be aware of your presence, that you'd help us to walk with you moment by moment, day by day, God, that, that our value and significance would not come just from what we do for you. They wouldn't, we wouldn't just be here because of what we hope you'll give us or do for us. God, I pray that you would be our greatest treasure. God, that you would be like that pearl of great price, that treasure in the field, that we would give everything just to have you, God. Thank you for giving everything just to have us. Thank you for viewing us as your pearl of great price, as your treasure in the field. Father, we love you. Help us to celebrate the cross, celebrate the resurrection as we take this communion. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.